Well, good evening and welcome to uh, this evening's webinar, which is looking at the Evangelical Alliance's new resource called Time to Talk. This evening, we are looking at better conversations about relationships and sex education. Um, we're thrilled to have you with us. First of all, just to say a very warm welcome to you. We really appreciate that on this cold and dark and damp in some places Monday evening. We really do appreciate you taking the time to join with us and to connect with us as we share our heart, we share some practical equipping and we share some information about this brand new resource from the EA with you. So thank you so much for your time. It seems to me that this is always topical to talk about these aspects of life and faith and growing up with children and young people. It is always timely. It is never easy but it is always really, really important. Um, as a mum of two myself, I have two boys who are 11 and 14 and 20 years or so being involved in youth ministry. I know that it's not always easy to speak to our children, maybe easier in youth ministry circumstances sometimes, but actually it just provokes lots of feelings amongst us as adults, parents, carers, grandparents, church leaders, youth ministers, whoever you might be joining us tonight. Um, and so it's really good to come together to look at this new resource and to hopefully share some wisdom, some experience, many of the challenges. Um, but we just hope and pray that this will resource you um, at this time and place. Um, just a few practicalities. We're on webinar mode, so you can't be seen. Um, our chat function is fully functioning. So I'd love it just from the get go. If you would, please do put your um, names or maybe just where you're from and your role title in the chat. We'd love to know who you are, where you're coming in from and who's joining us this evening. Excuse me. Also, just to say, as the evening goes on, we'd love to hear any questions or comments in the chat. Let me tell you a little bit about where we're going this evening. In a moment, I'll give you just a little bit of the background to this Time to Talk resource. But as we go through, you'll be introduced to my fellow um, panellists here and friends from EA um, and wider, further afield as well. And we hope to share, like I said, some, um, some experience and some thoughts with you this evening. But I'm delighted to be joined, as you'll see, by Gavin Calver, who's CEO of the Evangelical Alliance. David Smith, who is head of um, EA in Northern Ireland, um, by Orwin Marks, um, who is a practical theology and lecturer um, at the University uh, Theological College in Belfast. Welcome to Orwin from, um, from over in Ireland. And Alicia um, Edmund, who is head of public policy at the EA. So you're in good company this evening. As you said, this is being recorded, as you might have noticed. So if you find it useful, we'd love to encourage you right from the outset to be able to share it with people in your church and your family or your context to make it go far and wide if it's of use to you. Let me just share with you um, some of the background as to why we're here this evening. Well, um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar that some form of religious and sex education is shared within both our primary and our secondary schools across the UK. Though we might see that arguably our culture teaches more, doesn't it? I know from my boys as well, both with smartphones, with laptops and so on, um, so many messages come at them. I've run a girls group as well with teenage girls for the last 10, 12 years. We've talked many times about the images, the messages that come from social media and all that bombards us from our current culture. We know that both through that social media, through TV shows, through music, we are bombarded by those messages, many of which young people can't always make sense of, maybe don't always understand the terminology. But much of this content, as you know, will be absolutely explicit. But we know even more than that, it will be implicit as to the messages that that brings forth for young people, whether that's around dignity or worth or self-value. And all of that, we really hope and pray that as whether we are parents or youth workers, that actually we help our young people to make sense of things that of their own understanding around sex, around their bodies, around identity and who they are, as we believe as Christians made in the image of God. So we know that from surveys that have taken place um, decades ago, even more recently as well, we know that our young people want to talk about sex and relationships. They always have done. There's nothing new under the sun. But we know that it's always been a challenge as well. And many of you may be facing those challenges, as I am with my own teenage boys or tweenagers um, as well at the current time. I wonder that for you, as you reflect back to your own teenage years, what your recollections are as to whether those conversations came up within your own uh, family context or in youth work context. 
And I wonder even in me saying that, how it makes you feel. For some, it may make you absolutely inwardly cringe at the memories of the conversations that happened. It may be, however, that you have no recollection of those conversations. And even in the last few days, even in the lead up to this webinar, I've had two or three conversations with friends, even today, where one friend said they don't remember any conversation that took place within their household. I've also seen, mentioning the teenage girls that I've worked with, I've seen teenage girls actively as part of a conversation feel frustrated in their 20s, thinking back as to why didn't my parents speak to me about any of this, which was an interesting dialogue as well as they reflected back. So the conversation can sometimes be awkward. It can be awkward even talked about in the school context. And again, I've seen that through my own children. But it may be that many of you are with us today as a parent as well, actually concerned possibly at looking at how it's taught in our primary or secondary education, how gender identity is handled by teachers, both Christian or not. So many of these conversations are within our spheres of influence and impact on our young people. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us ultimately that silence on this issue is not an option. Um, whether we like it or not, actually by not saying anything, we're aware that actually we leave our children, if we don't speak to them about what our thoughts or feelings or emotions or learning or understanding might be, then actually we leave them at the hands of their mates, their school friends, maybe their par um, the parents of their school friends to teach them. And if not that, it may be Google or online that they look to search to find out maybe some of the the terminology of the words that they hear around them and don't understand or whatever it may be. So talking about sex and relationships, as we said, really does provide this fact that silence is not an option, as we've said already. So where does that bring us to? We recognise the challenges, we recognise some of the emotions, we recognise that silence isn't an option. So for us at the Evangelical Alliance, it's brought to this point of saying, actually, we would love to produce and have now produced this resource, Time to Talk, in order to equip um, hopefully encourage, hopefully to give confidence to all of us as parents or carers or grandparents and those around young people, as we said at this point in time. And there's no better place to start that than in the, in the home or in some of these trusted contexts. As we know, having better conversations um, will involve navigating some of these very contested and often um, very uh, um, contested issues where actually our culture has lots of different things to say. Um, but there again, it's important that we know what, how to express what we believe and as Christians, what we believe the Bible might say so that actually we're not seen as judgmental by our young people, which I know has often been the case of some of my peers with older teenagers, um, but actually we're able to put forward our thought through and valuable opinions. So really, when we whittle it all down, this really is a question of discipleship, isn't it, for our kids and for our young people. It's about us actually sharing our experiences, maybe with some vulnerability, maybe not. That will depend on where you feel it's right to draw boundary lines. Um, but actually, we do want our kids to follow Jesus in this rapidly changing and very difficult um, to navigate culture as we find ourselves in. So really, for us at the EA, we believe it's all about mission. It's about enabling our young people to come to the heart of the Bible, to come to the heart of Jesus um, and to really discover for themselves the good, true and beautiful story of Jesus in the context of sex and relationships and all that that would tell us. So we can't in all of this promise that one single resource is a quick or easy fix. It certainly won't be. We do hope, however, that it will unlock some of the practices, some of the big hitter conversations um, and really enable parents to grapple with some of those um, with greater confidence, maybe, than without this resource. And really, whether we feel it or not, actually, each and every one of these conversations is a privilege and it's a gift. It might not feel like it when we're thinking we'd much rather be doing anything else than speaking to our children um, about some of these tricky issues. But actually it is, isn't it? Because if we don't put across our moral values, our faith-based values, then as we said earlier, we really leave them to discover them for um, discover these values and so on for themselves, which of course go on to um, impact their, um, their practices and so on around sex and relationships into the future. So we've looked a little bit, that's some of the background, where it comes from, what our heart from the EA um, and friends is in producing this resource. But what's our approach? Well, just very briefly, um, there's two kind of guidelines, if you like, that have really um, led us as we've brought this resource together. One is this, that we want you, along with us, to be aware of the challenges, but not fearful. 
as we said, it's a privilege to be able to journey alongside our young people, to unpack some of this stuff, to grapple with the challenges, to not always know the answers, um, but to be not fearful in the midst of it as well. We want to be hopeful and focused on the opportunities, but not naive. And that's part of why we produce this resource so that actually we can together explore some of these contested issues. So we really want this resource to overridingly um, help equip and encourage and bring confidence um, to people like yourselves engaging with it tonight. We're taught not to fear, but that doesn't mean that we um, need to sidestep the challenges. Sometimes we need to grapple with some of this stuff head on, but we don't do it alone, do we? And often there are people around us that we can draw in as well. But even more than that, we're told, aren't we, in the Bible, to cast our anxiety on Jesus. And why wouldn't Jesus want to equip us and help us in these important and often pivotal conversations as well? As it says in the opening part of the resource, it says two things which stuck uh, me as I was rereading it um, just earlier today. It says that no one is better placed to have these conversations than you. Actually, we don't always feel like that as parents, but actually whether our young people make us feel like it or not, often not, but they do listen to our words. Our voice is important alongside them. Um, our values, our, our opinions are important. So no one is better placed. And just lastly, this is part of an ongoing conversation, hopefully within your household, within your youth context. Um, it's not just one big hitter conversation that says it all, but our hope is, is that this will encourage you. So like that dripping tap, it opens up communication channels um, so that it's an ongoing conversation. So I hope in saying all of that, that that just gives a little bit of a framework as to where we've come from, what we're about, what Time to Talk is about. But I'm just going to pray for us, if that's OK. And then I'm going to hand over to David Smith, who's been a big part in producing this resource, um, along with others. So let me pray for us. And then, David, I'll hand over to you. Father God, we just thank you that you made us. You made our children, you made our young people, Lord, whatever our role is and for whatever reasons we've come to this webinar tonight. Lord, I thank you that you bring peace into the midst of this challenging topic. Lord, thank you that you created us so molded in your image that we are so made for relationship. You created sex as a good thing. And Lord, against the complexities of culture and ever changing um, conversations around this, Lord, thank you that you can and will give us confidence and give us boldness to be able to find the right time, the right places to speak to our young people. So Lord, I pray that in all that we share tonight, would you just be with um, us and my friends who are listening in, and we just pray, Lord, would you just equip us um, and guide us in these conversations both now and into the future. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So David, I introduced you just a moment ago as head of Northern Ireland EA. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to you to tell us a bit more about the background to the resource and its content, if that's okay. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so yes, it's, um, let me just spotlight myself one second. Here we go. Uh, it's my, my privilege to be here tonight and to chat to you about this. I have worked for the EA for 12 years and I love what we do. Um, I was a lawyer beforehand, so I'm into policy and legislation. Um, I, I then went into public policy work with the EA, and for the last three years, I've led the work that we do in Northern Ireland. That involves still engaging with our government when we have one, and engaging um, in the public square, in media, with the human rights bodies, equality legislation, all of these kinds of complex conversations, and also with the church. I'm also a, a dad of three kids and I'm involved heavily in my own church and at each of those spaces this conversation comes up. How do we have better conversations about RSE, about relationships and, and sex education with our children and do we dare even have good conversations with our children's schools as well? How do we be a positive uh, voice in this space for the common good? I've put the, the link in the chat to the resource that we're talking about, Time to Talk. So it's right there and you can follow through as I'm, as I'm chatting. You can download a free copy and take that away and read it. But why this, why now? Well, it, it could have been producing any time, really. But there's not a day goes past without stories in the news about some kind of conflict in the classroom or in the education system uh, about these kinds of issues. We see it in public policy at Westminster. We see it in the nations. Um, and it's, as I say, everyday conversations that we're having. Uh, and as I was speaking to lots of people, uh, it was generally uh, a fear, an awkwardness, 
uh, maybe a silence and a hesitancy around even having these conversations with our children and a lack of confidence about the good news and what the gospel brings into this conversation, particularly around these very contested issues. And uh, so we were uh, sort of working on this for a while and, and really glad that it's out and, and I hope it's a real benefit to you. Um, we are not necessarily the experts in all of these fields at all, um, but we have worked and collaborated with many of our members and others who are experts, and that's what we do at the EA. Uh, the resource, just to go through it, is divided into three sections. So the first section looks at home and how can parents and carers have better conversations with their own children uh, in, in their house, in their home environment. Um, we, we look at ages and stages, we look at puberty, we look at how to naturally begin conversations um, in that sort of home context. The second section looks at schools, and we look at some of the law around um, RSE policy in each of the devolved nations and in England, and the right or freedom of parents to withdraw their child um, from maybe some lessons. So we, we cover all of that in there. And then the third section looks at the bigger stories of play, and I'll, I'll come on to that in just a moment. But it's full of handy hints, uh, case studies, uh, the issues like pornography, abortion, consent, um, transgender in the classroom. How do we approach and deal with these really controversial, sensitive, difficult issues as Christians? How do we bring good news into this space? Um, it's really tempting, isn't it, to jump straight into the heat of one of those issues. And that's what culture wants us to do, to really jump into the heat of a conversation. And what we try to do in the last section of this resource on the bigger stories is encourage parents and carers to take a step back and to look at the bigger stories that are being told in our culture right now, to look at the cultural story and what that says to young people about their identity, their worth, their purpose in life. Uh, about what relationships are and, and where those boundaries may or may not be. And then we look at the, the biblical story and what that says about who we are. And what I find is that many different people of different faiths and none um, do have concerns uh, about some of what is being taught in RSE. And they want common sense to prevail, uh, but they also want um, good news and they want hope and they want human dignity um, to be championed. They want their, their child um, to be protected from some of the bad stuff that's out there and encouraged into making good choices for themselves. And I think we all want that as, as parents. There's some good things going on in culture right now. There's certainly less stigmatization about talking about these things. Um, there's less stigma about pregnancy crisis and all kinds of things uh, and, and more openness to lots of different conversations. There's also lots of concerns, as I say, about consent and our, our ability to even disagree well around some of these issues. But what I think we have right now is an amazing opportunity. Gav will probably mention these two words because it's framed his leadership within the EA, but I think there's a real opportunity for us to be brave and to be kind, to be confident and to be compassionate. In the biblical story talks about creation that is good, the fall, about redemption and renewal. There's a narrative there that we are called into live and to find our um, identity, our relationship and our purpose. Um, we're called to be people of light and of love and of life. Um, and when I look around right now, there's a lot of confusion and conflict and isolation. So I think this is an amazing moment and opportunity for us to, to bring this good news in. Um, we also want to encourage good relationships in the widest sense. My colleague Phil Knox just launched his book this week, uh, last week called The Best of Friends. It's all about the value of friendship. Uh, and so we speak about relationships and sex education within this much broader view of good citizenship, being a good neighbour, uh, being a good friend. Uh, and so all of that's in the mix as well within this resource. As I just wrap up my section, just want to touch on two other uh, parts of the resource that I think are important for just now. We look at some distinctions that are out there um, or, or maybe aren't out there at times, and we try to draw some distinctions that might be helpful for parents. Um, maybe a line between bullying and disagreement. And some people are very scared to disagree in, in case they're accused of bullying um, and of being anti-trans, anti-LGBT, whatever, whatever it may be. And so we want to give people confidence to disagree well, 
uh, and obviously want to encourage no one to be uh, victimized um, because of who they believe themselves to be. Um, we differentiate between facts and ideas and what is being taught in the classroom. Is it, is it facts? Is it uh, ideas? Is it opinions? Is it ideology? And just helping young people to discern between some of these things, between bullying and disagreement, between facts and ideas, between identity and behaviours. Um, and, and we just try and tease some of that out between what is a good and appropriate pastoral care for one young person and what is good normative teaching in a classroom setting for everyone. So we try and draw some of that out. And the last thing I just want to end with is postures, because often people don't hear exactly what we say, but they will remember how we said it. And what we say is really important. The truth is really important, but grace, and, and we want to be uh, humble and gracious in how we communicate these very contested ideas. We want to be hospitable, um, people who are, are not scared or faithful, who, who want to share space with others and, and want to be hospitable. Uh, we want to be wise. Uh, we want to be creative and proactive. And this resource really encourages you to be proactive, to take steps as you um, engage with your children, with their school, um, on the front foot rather than always being reactive. So that's a brief summary of the content of the resource. Um, Rich, I'll just hand back to you um, at this point. Amazing. Thank you so much, David. Hopefully um, all that David's just shared there just goes to further inform you as to, again, some of the content, the backdrop, the practicalities that are shared, and also the manner in which that we've gone about pulling this together to further equip you. Um, I'm going to hand out um, over now, with no further ado, to my colleague Alicia. Alicia Edmonds, as I said earlier, is Head of Public Policy at the EA. Alicia, share a little bit. I know you're going to interview one of our guests, um, Alwyn, so um, let me go with you. Go for it. Amazing. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, and evening to everyone who's joining us on the call. As Rachel said, I'm the Head of Public Policy for the Evangelical Alliance and pleased to participate in this evening's webinar to answer any questions that you might have, but most importantly, to engage in a conversation with Dr. Alwyn Mark. Uh, just wanting to give a brief summary uh, of who she is and the expertise that she brings to this conversation for those that join the call slightly later. Uh, Dr. Alwyn Mark Mark is a lecturer in practical theology in the Union Theological College Belfast and has previously worked in public policy for Care Northern Ireland and program manager for Love for Life. So a real rich knowledge and experience uh, in academia, church life and education policy. Uh, we had a brief introduction last week, getting to know one another, and we was talking very much what you've heard already about the cultural narratives that have shaped a lot of relationship and sex education up until this point. Um, way back when, in the late 1990s, relationship and sex education was confronting a social and health problem of the day, which was a rise in teen pregnancy, as well as a rise in sexually transmitted disease and infection. Today, the Department of Education, as well as parliaments across uh, the United Nations, uh, United Nations, the United Kingdom rather, have uh, created statutory guidance on relationship and sex education that is confronting the social norms and problems of today. We are seeing a rise in pornography amongst adults as well as children as young as 13 in their access. We see a rise in digital media amongst young people, a rise in sexual harassment and violence towards women and girls, and sadly, peer-to-peer -peer abuse within schools and colleges that is referenced in page 30 of Time to Talk paper. So, so much of the cultural narratives of the day has shaped RS. E policy and Orwin has very much created a thesis, written a thesis that is tried to shift and shape that differently to come from a different perspective. Orwin, it'd be great to hear your heart behind this uh, and kind of introduce your thesis uh, to us. Yeah, thank you, Alicia, and um, thank you for the invitation to, to be here this evening. Um, just to, to congratulate the EA on this resource, I think it's it is very timely and I think it's 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 rich and, and important, and I think there's lots in it to open up conversation. Um, I suppose just in terms of my own um, background and interest in this, I also came from a public policy background, so I'd worked in Parliament and um, 
and um, politics and then moved into working with care. Um, and then through that, at that time, we were looking at a sexual health strategy in, in Northern Ireland. Um, so began to just get engaged with that and, and looking particularly then at um, how education and health interact on this issue as a policy issue. And so became um, engaged with the work of Love for Life in Northern Ireland and so joined, joined the team uh, there. And that was a local project started by a GP that got invited was invited by um, a local school to go in and deliver programs. So um, I, I think as people read this resource, I hope as, as David has, has talked about that creativity, that there'll be those that are inspired to, to think, how do I bring my, my uh, profession, my skills, my expertise to offer something to our local schools and to this conversation? Um, so that was the that was the background to leading me then on to to further study and to thinking more deeply about these issues, and it led me on to to, to studying theology and then into doing a, a PhD, looking at um, I suppose thinking around a Christian approach to these issues, but also thinking around the narratives and culture and society and uh, within it. So I completed the PhD at the London School of Theology in in two thousand and fifteen. Um, I suppose just a couple of things to say about what I was wanting to explore. I was wanting to explore, um, I suppose, some of the value judgments that were being made around the policy approaches and, and what we were um, seeking to do, both within education and within health promotion. And I think it's really important, and, and the resource highlights this, to recognise that there's no value neutral RSE. Just as there's no neutral public space, there's no neutral education, that all education is um, has explicit explicit or implicit judgments in it um, and when it mm -hmm. comes to, to RSE as a society we've made a judgment firstly that it should be taught as a subject in school we've made a judgment then about the content of it and we talk about even as we think about facts and ideas we've made a judgment on what facts we should talk about what ideas will shape that um, and so I wanted to, to, to explore those um, I suppose to critique in particular a, a narrative of, of informing choice that we that we give young people the maximum amount of information and then from that that they will reason and 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 make their sexual choices. Um, and I suppose in that I wanted us to, to think about the young person, not just as an autonomous thinker, but actually our young person as embodied in a culture and community. Um, my video is doing something funny here. Let me. <laughs> So start that. So how, how do we understand the learner that we have? Um, again, we want young people to get great information, but we also want to recognize that young people are embodied in communities, that they're relational, and therefore it's not just about giving young people um, information. It's about looking at the cultural narrative that is shaping those choices. So of course, young people um, make choices and we want them to make great choices, but but what is the moral vision for those choices? How are we inspiring those choices? What are we telling them about relationships and sex and, and what those mean and the importance of those? And so those are some of the things that I was wanting to, to explore in that research. So moving it to thinking about not just the information that we want to give young people in education, but actually thinking about what is a, what is a relationally and sexually educated young person um, and what do we want young people to know? But what, what do we want young people to be? What are the character traits that, mm -hmm. that we want actually young people to, who do we want them to become in relationships? Um, so uh, so those are some of the, the ideas that I was exploring. Amazing. So moving from that moment of, of ideas, just in some of your kind of conversations, both in the creation and the study of that uh, research paper and, and what you've gone on to do, what was some of the feedback that you were hearing either from organisations or parents or teachers? What were some of the core findings that you that you, that you came across? Well, I suppose one of the things that I was keen to think about was as, as, as Christians, how, do, how can we enrich the narrative that is mm -hmm. there around um, RSE and how can we um, have, a, have a transformative role in education and not not withdraw, but actually choose to actively engage in, in the shaping of policy and the content of what happens in the classroom um, and, and actively partner with schools 
Um, and so it really with the conviction that you know more young people need moral guidance in making choices that we don't just leave young people to to um to, to find truth by themselves, that we actually we need to be shaping a cultural narrative that is that is helping them to um, understand what healthy and flourishing relationships look like. Um, and so it was beginning to, to think about some of the how as Christians can we enrich that narrative? And I think as we think about um, strong and positive relationships, I think Christian values and virtues have so much to speak to that. Um, mm. So looking at the, even the concept of love and how that is engaged in RSE discourse. Um, David was mentioning there the idea of friendship. Um, how, how, does, how is that presented um, within, within RSE discourse? Um, so what are, what are some of the, the values and the virtues that are inspired by our Christian faith that we actually want to nurture um, in and, and to see young people grow in and into? And I think in, increasingly in, um, in, in the narrative around RSE, we're finding it difficult to make that connection between sex and relationships and, and sex and love. The two have been separated. And so how can we enrich the narrative by, by bringing those um, to together. So, so really, I think the challenge for us is, as, as, as Christians engaging in this space is how do we enrich the narrative and how do we bring a renewed moral vision to young people for their sexual um, lives and their sexual choices? Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of conversation around abstinence education and it's seen as ineffective, as unrealistic, mm -hmm. as moralistic. And yet young people need to make choices about when to say yes to sexual activity and when to say no. And so what, what reasons can we give young people to, to say yes and, and, and to say no? Um, and again, there's the expectation that young people will be sexually active, um, but how, how can we tell a different story to them? Mm. I love that phrase that you used of a renewed moral vision. Uh, and just kind of my last question before I hand back um, to Rachel, for those parents and carers who are on the call uh, that are confronting a culture for which has distilled sex uh, and human sexuality as kind of the pursuit of pleasure, distilled to about consent, which is being taught in, in RSE education, how do we kind of give a biblical story on human sexuality for a child who is young as eight? Because there's some of the conversations and influences that are happening at school to a student who's 17, 18 and slightly older. How do how do how can parents go about that? Yeah, well, I think I think this is where the resource is really helpful and practical in terms of ages and stages and and how we how parents might um, open up the, the conversations and and open up the, the questions um, and allowing those to be led by by children and, and by young people um, and. I think we need to be listening really carefully to children and young people. We need to be taking the time to do that. Um, I think we need to be listening really carefully to the culture and what are the what are the longings of the culture when it comes to these issues? What are the pains of, of the culture? Um, how can we listen really carefully to that? And we need to listen really carefully to our, our Christian story and to, to the moral vision that will emerge from that, both for children and young people, but but for society as well and, and for relationships. So my encouragement to parents is, is be informed and, and be engaged as this resource suggests. I think there is opportunity for engagement. And um, within, within all of the nation states, um, parents have opportunity to be proactive in engaging, whether it's an RSE policy or in, in what's finding out what is, what is being taught. And again, the resource has some really helpful questions for parents or carers to find out you know, what, what is being taught in the RSE curriculum. Um, and I would also encourage us as, as, as Christians and as, as concerned adults and parents and carers, not, not just to be those that show up to school when there's something to contest or complain about or there's an issue, but actually how do we really invest in our schools and in our teachers and, and in all young people, not just protect to seem to be protecting our own, but actually that we care about all young people in there were before we're invested um, in, in these issues for the for the sake of all young people. So so find out opportunities to serve your schools. Um, I think again, we're living in difficult days where, where teachers find these issues difficult, you know, and and there's not easy answers. And so how can we 
be parents and carers and adults that, that serve our schools beyond these issues, but the build up relationships so that we then have opportunity to have conversations around these issues. Thank you, Owen. Amazing. We've only skimmed the surface, um, but I'm going to hand it back to you, Rachel, and we're both on the panel conversation if you have further conversations or questions for us both. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alicia. Thank you again, um, Dr. Orwin. Really appreciate all your insights of your studies as well. So helpful. Um, you've heard a little bit from our friends so far about the, the context, the, the culture, the challenges, the schools backdrop, the cultural narrative and so on. Delighted to hand over now to um, Gavin, who was mentioned earlier, is um, Gav Calvary, CEO of the Evangelical Alliance. And Gav, coming to you as a parent to embed some of this into your own practical findings, some of the joys, the challenges. I guess my question for you is just from your experience of, I know having two children, I'm sure you can tell us a little bit about your family context. What's been your experience? What have been some of your findings and, and maybe some of the top tips along the way? What, what would you, connecting with this resource, time to talk, um, let me hand over to you to share some of your experience, if that's okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us. And I'm just going to speak as a parent and a previous youth worker, really. And David stole some of my thunder because he talked about being brave and kind, which that is my approach to leading the EA. But it also is very much my approach to parenting in this space. Um, and I just think a few things for me, really. And one would be if you have little ones, don't be afraid to have awkward conversations with them. You know, the culture is starting so young. And it's important that we do too. I remember when my kids were small, I've got a 16 year old and a 12 year old now, but my kids were small. Uh, the one TV show I quite liked them watching was Peppa Pig. Because Peppa Pig was the only TV show on which you had two parents, they might have been pigs, but they still loved each other and were together. And grandparents that still loved each other and were together and modeled something of a family value that I wanted modeling to my kids. However, even Peppa Pig, aimed at tiny kids, often preschool, has now brought in some new characters, let's say, and there's changed. So, so I think we need to be prepared to have the conversations or we do get a bit left behind. Um, I guess we've tried not to have any RSE subject off the list with our kids. Um, we've tried to be open and talk about these things. We live in London and so it's a metropolitan setting. So those, some of those chats have happened earlier, perhaps. Um, I remember taking my son in with me to King's Cross, where EA is, where there's an arts college around the corner, and he was quite young. And uh, that led to some interesting conversations with some of the people he encountered uh, in the middle of London. But that was fun. I think one thing for us that's really important is to model relationships in the home. When they were small, when our kids were at primary school age, that was about us. I know not everyone has the same, but... But if you are in a healthy relationship, the modelling of that to your kids is the best education you can give them in what healthy relationships are. For me, the best thing I could do for my kids is to love their mum and to model that. I think now that my kids are a bit older, we're exposing them actively to other families and, uh, and role models of healthy relationships too. I think for us, though, because we're aware that our kids are very privileged, they've got two parents that love them, love Jesus, and uh, love one another. And so they're a very privileged position. And so what we've done in our house as well is try to extend our table to allow other kids in, because it's not just about the biological children, it's about helping other kids as well. So last week was half term, so it was the week of sleepovers, where there were loads of kids in our house at different times. And part of that as well is modeling things like, we have a family dinner table. A lot of their friends don't do that. We do that every day. In fact, it's in leading EA, if I'm in the office, I leave at five. Why? Because that's the only way I can be home in time to have dinner with my kids. And that's always been important to us. I think we have to prepare our kids, and Alwyn talked about this a bit, prepare our kids for the possibility of being different. It's really difficult to live by a, a Christian ethic sexually in this day and age, and, and that's really difficult. Um, we try to help ours um, by having certain safeguards in place, use of screens in different contexts where they're not used. Um, I've also been quite surprised, if I'm honest, uh, having been a youth worker for years and having grown up in a generation where it was a bit generation binge in the 90s when I was a young person. Our encountering of our own kids and their friends and other people seems to be that they are quite ideologically advanced, but not that engaged in doing all kinds of crazy things. Put it another way. The Guardian did a piece recently that said our young people are drinking less, smoking less, 
having less sex and less, but they're deciding that they are this, this and this and this without actually then living those things. So we're living in a really challenging time where ideologically we may engage in conversation, but lifestyle and thought process don't always match up. A guy called Mark Sayers writes about this and he says, we've got a generation of young people who live like they're living for the kingdom, but they don't want the king. And so the way they're living is more puritanical than previous generations, yet they're being told stuff that's mean they're ideologically developed. I think it's important for us to know how secondary schools work. Uh, primary school is a lot easier to engage with, to be part of the community, to be a positive input. But the lack of a school gate at secondary school mustn't stop us having a presence in that community where we can positively, but also where we can get access to, to teachers to discuss stuff. Uh, we, we moved our daughter's school because she was in a school where they said everything was student led and whatever the students wanted to do, they'd be able to do. And so in that context, she tried for two and a half years to start a Christian union and they weren't having it. And I went in to see the school and there were all kinds of problems about what was being pushed in that school. And in fact, their suggestion was my daughter became a Stonewall champion to help her make more friends instead of pursuing the faith. So and it, was, it was a mess, but God was good and we, we moved where she was. But but you need to know that you have access to the school. We don't have to just suffer in silence or, or sending a letter saying that you're really delighted with what people have been doing in the school. We just have to know that we still have access to schools. I think we also need to know that a school and what an individual teacher might say are not always the same thing. So I've had uh, an encounter with a deputy head at my kid's school recently because our son Daniel was, they had, a, they had a session on sexuality and he was talking about how he didn't think it was okay for two people of the same sex to get married in a church. And he was told by a teacher that he had to rethink what he believed because that was an outdated view. Now, the school actually is there to educate, not to indoctrinate. And so we, we know the deputy head, I was able to have a chat. And actually that one teacher, you could easily think that teacher represents everything about the school, but actually that's not true all the time. And so what we need to do is be able to speak up and out. I guess my biggest tip as a parent at this point would be to pray for your kids, their schools and their teachers. When you pray for stuff, it changes your disposition towards it. Obviously, we pray for our kids all the time. But if you don't pray for their schools, if you don't pray for their teachers by name, start doing that. I think the other thing I'd say is let's pour into our children when they're young in the hope that that will help them keep going. Let's show them a better way. Let's model to them what positive relationships are. Let's not seem like the people that are the fun sponges, but we're the people that do, a di do it differently. And the final thing I'd say, desecularize, especially when you've got teenagers, desecularize them at the weekends and in the school holidays. There is some things that, that go on in a very secular environment of a school that are very different to a Christian home. And so when we have them in our homes, let's not be expecting the schools to be doing the discipleship for us. Let's be doing it in our homes. And let's be making sure that we are putting the same energy into pouring into our kids developing them pointing them towards jesus as we are to making sure that their school is not teaching them stuff we wouldn't want to teach them so let's pray let's go for it and uh let's in the end trust our kids to the lord and do all we can in the process amazing thanks so much gab that's really helpful against the context of all that we've looked at from policy from some of the structures that we find ourselves working within some of the nuances but also the sensitivities as to how to engage and um, what we're going to do now for the next sort of 10 minutes or so is just have a bit of a panel with all four of you um david i don't know if that's okay to spotlight maybe um all five of us on screen but i'd love to just throw a few questions out and indeed please do um as panelists yourself bring up anything that you don't feel has been um said yet but um thanks for all that you've um you've all shared i'm sure those watching have probably got their own questions that they could contact with um off the back of this webinar um or speak about further um there's so many details that we could drop to from all the um, drop into rather from all that you've shared already um gab i wonder if i can come back to you in the first instance and ask just before we think about some of the um, places that we find ourselves we've talked about school talked about culture we've talked about parenting and so on from the place of starting with ourselves, if there's people listening, thinking, I know what you're all saying is right, I've got to have the conversations, it's not an option being silent and so on. Again, we've said we've all had different experiences in our own upbringing and parenting, whether those conversations took place or not. 
what would you say um, to parents that just think, I know I've got to have the conversation, but I really don't want to. How do we get beyond that in a, to a place where we battle against ourselves almost to find ourselves, maybe not on one occasion, but like you said, from young to old, how can we gain and step into confidence to even broach these topics, which we sometimes feel our young people won't want to speak to us about. And moreover, we don't want to speak into really, if we're honest. Yeah, I, just, I think we just need 10 seconds of outrageous bravery, to be honest. Because uh, uh, once you start that conversation, you don't necessarily regret it. Outrageous bravery and and coming across as the least judgmental you've ever been as a parent, particularly in the teenagers, is, is the way I think to kick it off. I also think that however scared we are of it, if you're not having these conversations, then you're outsourcing them to other people. And that when we do that, we then create the problem that all the influences will be very different. And so we can't expect, even if you're outsourcing someone good, your, t your youth worker can't do in an hour a week what you haven't done in 15 years. You know, we as parents, we do just have to kind of own this, be outrageously brave and start a conversation. And also, there's no formula. I've got two kids. They couldn't be more different. They couldn't like to talk about this stuff in different ways. One of them would rather talk about anything with me than this. The other one, frankly, loves it. So, you know, <laughs> completely different children as well. So treat your kids different, be brave. But if you don't do it, someone else will. Great. Thank you. Um, and David, I wonder just off the back of that, you've got slightly younger children, I believe, than Gav. At what age is it appropriate to start these conversations? We've heard about, I think Alicia said, you know, um, or maybe it was Dr. Orwin, about the age of eight. How do, how do we enter into that kind of setting that, that posture, as you mentioned, that culture of communicating with our kids? At what, type, at what um, age or stage is it appropriate to even begin? Yeah, I think what we find is generally the kids bring the conversation to you before you're expecting it sometimes. So we kind of uh, maybe thought, oh, maybe you don't need to think about that for a while. Um, but actually kids maybe bring the conversation to you. And what we've tried to do, my, my wife's a midwife. Uh, so our kids know about babies, about basically where they come from, these sorts of questions, because kids ask those questions and they're interested. And we try to give sort of age appropriate answers to them. That are that are correct, that are factually true, that are biblically true and right. The children do come because mummy and daddy love each other sometimes, and, and these sorts of things happen. Uh, but also, they they are a gift from God, and there's also biological, um, you know, things that happen during sex. So we we try and talk about you know love and relationships about God and the Bible and about the biology and your body as well. Um, and, and try and bring those things together because they're all different parts of telling the, the story. Uh, and we do, yeah, we try and do it in, in age appropriate um, ways. But I mean, our, our four year old has some brilliant questions that he just comes out with. And then we almost panic and think, oh, how do we answer this? And then two minutes later, he's off talking about um, Pokemon. Uh, so it's trying to give, give a simple answer to a simple question and a straightforward answer and not not um, jumping in too deep, kind of letting them maybe lead a little bit of that, engaging. Whereas our nine-year-old's very thoughtful. She'll come downstairs after she's gone to bed because she's been up there thinking about something. And that takes a bit more of a sit down and, okay, we need to talk about this a bit further. So uh, I think Gav's advice about your children being different and um, it's not just a stock response um, is important. And, and com little conversations, not sitting them down for the big talk, um, but little conversations, I think, is a really healthy approach. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Yeah, so maybe age appropriate, getting that gauge, like you said, the little and often being open, fostering that culture of communication within our own houses by the sounds of it, being able to go on that narrative over, over the long period of time. Um, Dr. Orwin, you spoke into um, particularly that you said about you know, we're inspiring their choices and working with sort of, um, it's not just information, do you like that? Um, uh, and you were saying about enriching that narrative. From your experience, what would your advice be again to parents um, in terms of that, you know, inspiring people's choices? I know young people are bombarded with so many choices. They often don't know what to think. From a Christian perspective, from an evangelical backdrop, how would you, what would your suggestions be as to how we inspire young people's choices? Any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, I think just going back to policy, there's actually when we talk about kind of healthy relationships and flourishing relationships, there's qualities of, around those that are actually written into to guidance around RSEs. So those things like 
um, you know, kindness, trustworthiness, respect, dignity, all of that stuff is is there in policy. And so we want to see that outworked and in, in how that is it's not only embodied in an RSE class, but actually embodied in a school. And so we want to, to encourage schools to actually really um, seek to, to, to nurture and, and demonstrate those values. But I think, again, just to emphasizing the importance of what's, what children, young people will see in the home in, when it comes to, to those values and, and how, those, how those are lived out. Um, again, what we watch in, um, you know, in, in TV or film, we don't always see those types of, you know, relationships and um, even helping young people to understand what, what is healthy and unhealthy and what is good. And, um, you know, I suppose virtues or values like, like faithfulness. And, you know, again, that's something that is, is so, so deep in, in our Christian narrative of the faithfulness of God and how as Christians we're to live out that faithfulness. So, where we see that, we we celebrate it, um, and so again with with things like um, friendship and and Christian marriage, that you know faithfulness is at, is at the heart of that, and we should all embody that value, um, and we should celebrate it when we see it. So I think it's I think it's both young people seeing it lived out, but also celebrated um, in in the school and and in the home. Absolutely. And we know so many of us know, you know, young people can cut through sometimes what we say if we don't live it out with integrity and authenticity. So I think what you're saying about modelling, you know, whether again we're a parent, a, a youth leader, a church leader, it's really important. Isn't it? Alicia, I wonder if I can ask you, we've talked a bit about sort of the school um, and the home and so on. In terms of church, how do we raise some of these issues? Do they, is it important for us as, as parents or as individuals? How do we even start doing that? And who with? Who should we be speaking to? Well, I know from uh, kind of Evangelical Alliance member organisations that many have produced resources uh, to kind of engage the conversation of faith, sexuality, what does it mean to be a Christian in modern culture, and just to kind of, I think we cite a few of those uh, in the resource, um, looking at the likes of Scripture Union, they do do endless resources around for schools, for kind of youth groups, for Sunday services uh, that kind of talk about those values that we've spoken before and how they relate to the subjects like, you know, PSHE and citizenship and the Easter message and Christmas and how to engage your children around, you know, kind of the Halloween season uh, and how to be children of light and what, what does that mean uh, biblically. I know Youth for Christ have also produced resources that are aimed kind of youth leaders to engage in kind of um in the difficult conversations I think both led in this report as well as within kind of public policy spaces young people want to know how do I have healthy relationships and at the moment the culture distills that into kind of a sexual transaction which is ultimately unfulfilling you know the relationships between boys and girls in the classroom friendships are always kind of distilled to something not platonic, but more of a sexual nature. And there's so much opportunity for us to talk about how do you do friendships well? Um, how do we speak into that with greater kind of credence and, and value in that? So there are definitely resources um, that are referenced in this resource uh, with the, and on the EA website that support church leaders to, to teach in this space, to have pastoral conversations and to kind of continue to support parents to have these ongoing conversations in the home. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. And just to reiterate that, as you said, within the resource, we signpost to lots of those other brilliant organisations who can equip, whether it's parents or youth leaders, like you said, to, again, gain greater confidence in having the material to use to actually engage with some of these dialogues as well as um, time to talk itself. So, yeah, thanks, Alicia. Um, just to open it up for anyone who'd like to speak to it, um, we mentioned earlier, I think Gav mentioned as well from a parent's perspective, and certainly I know from uh, my own uh, peers as well, you know, I think you mentioned earlier, if when we broach some of these conversations with young people, certainly my finding through particularly with friends with slightly older um, kids than mine, actually where they've voiced a, maybe a traditionally biblically view um, about some of sex and relationships and so on, they've been faced with these comments of, you know, it's really judgmental or you're anti-gay or anti-transgender, anti this, anti that. Um, because often what they see is this broad acceptance of everything, maybe not always with the understanding. What would be some of your advice, again, as to what a parent's stance can be, or again, we use that word posture, when actually, you know, we come from our own uh, faith-based backdrop, how can we actually 
not just quash some of those conversations, but actually have real wisdom in kind of engaging and drawing that out, teasing it out, speaking into um, those contexts when sometimes our young people will put us down almost as not having an opinion that matches with what they see in their culture, but actually engaging with some of that and helping to broaden their understanding. Or as we said earlier, putting in our own biblical viewpoint for them to start to understand any thoughts or reflections or experiences even around how we grapple with some of that without just our young people feeling like we're shutting them up and bulldozing them with our own view? Gav, let me come to you. Is that something you face? Or David, sorry, you weren't off mute there. I, I cannot, yeah, I'm, I'm just slightly aware of time as well for folks. So just, I think what I would say is um, labels are not helpful. And so when labels are thrown at you, you're this or you're that or you're this, this, it doesn't help the conversation and in the, some, some ways we've lost the educational space there i think that would be my concern slightly in the secondary school space is we've gone from education to indoctrination and and i think that we are able to kick back on that a little bit i think it's really hard for our teenagers i think we need so much sympathy for them i know there's moments with my kids where they have towed the party line to have an easier life and you know what i can't get across with them i can just say guys next time come on sort yourself out be brave you know jesus jesus died for you you can step up you know and 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 I, so i do think we need to be sensitive and i do think it's difficult but i also think as well that just as as much as we're trying to be kind there needs to be a kindness shown all around in this and i think that jesus says come and see more than he says come and hear and perhaps if we can show a better way of engaging in these difficult spaces when the mud is being thrown, then we can point to a, a better way of living too. Thanks, Gav. David, we come to you before we wrap up. Yeah, I'll probably go back to the point I made and anyone who's probably heard me over the last 10 years, I just keep coming back to this bigger story that we are a part of. We, we are story creatures. We live in a story. And I think there's a moment to ask questions of the story that our culture is telling. Uh, as Gav says, the king with uh, the kingdom without the king, I think there's a real desire for goodness, for justice, for social justice, for integrity in politics and in all kinds of things. And um, so I think people don't disagree that our world is broken. Uh, when we see Me Too, when we see all kinds of things, there's there's a people, there's a shared common understanding that things are broken. I think there's an opportunity to bring hope and to talk about identity, relationships and purpose in a really um, provocative but gracious way and introduce people to Jesus. And I love what Gav just said about letting them see him and the way he treated people um, and, and that true, good, beautiful story coming to life for them. Amazing. Thanks so much, David. Um, and thanks to um, Stephen who's put in the chat there. As you'll see, the resource Time to Talk is there, free to download. Um, just as we draw our conversations um, to a close, just on behalf of those listening, let me say a huge thanks to you, David and Alicia, um, Alwyn and Gav, really appreciate your time and all your input and your vulnerability as well in talking about family life and the challenges um, that this provokes, as well as the learning as well from um, policy and um, studies background. We really do appreciate that. Um, just before we wrap up, three things um, to just mention to you. One is... Um, for all those listening, if you wanted to get hold of the resource, as we've said, the free downloadable copy is at the link that you'll see in the chat. If you wanted a printed copy, again, to distribute to those in your church community or in your families or youth ministry, um, then please do contact us. Um, and we'd love to order some of those for you and get those distributed out to you as soon as possible to serve you in whatever way um, you can use them and distribute them wider. As we said earlier, this is being recorded. If you think some of what we've shared might be useful, um, we'll send it out to you on email or please do contact us sooner and um, we'll send that out to you. Um, we'd also love to say if in your context where you are, if you would appreciate one of the team from the EA um, or wider to come and share and to kind of grapple with some of this stuff with you individually, then please do contact us. We'd love to partner with you. We'd love to serve you with it. We'd love to engage in bigger conversations. So if that would help you at any time now or in the future, please do contact us at the EA and we can filter those requests on so that we can serve alongside you 
and again dig deeper into some of this uh, for you where you're at. Lastly, just to say, as many of us as you know, are part of the Evangelical Alliance, we are a member organisation um, and we love to serve with member churches, individual members and member organisations. We would love to invite you tonight to join with us as an individual member um, or indeed as part of a church or an organisation. Um, but for just three pounds a month, we'd love to invite you as an individual or as a couple to come and join us. All of what we've shared tonight um, is only made possible by having the strength of our members. And that is, as you've heard, to be able to speak into the corridors of power through our advocacy team and our presence in Westminster is to really engage with our member churches and organisations to really equip and serve them in aspects of mission and evangelism. So if you would like to join your voice with ours and see Jesus made known across the UK, also creating resources like this that we hope and pray will serve and support you as individuals or as the church, then as I said, we'd love to invite you tonight to join with us as a member. It's only three pounds a month, as I mentioned. We'd love to send you a free resource, um, a free book as well, a trolley coin and many other things which come with the membership pack. Um, so please do, even tonight, even before you sign off, go to eauk.org forward slash join us. Um, and we'd really value and appreciate you adding your voice to ours um, as we make Jesus known um, in this missional landscape at this time and place. So I wonder if, Alicia, I wonder if I can put you on the spot. Just as we say, huge thanks um, to everyone for joining us. Alicia, would you just pray for us in the challenges and the joys that these conversations bring us to? Is that all right? Thank you. Yeah, of course. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to kind of gather this evening and to listen, to learn, to hear your heart for children and young people across this nation, your love and desire to be known by them and to live in and through them, Lord. And I just really pray for parents, for teachers, for carers on this call, Lord, that are wanting to raise their children to to know you to love you but also to be in a school that celebrates their faith uh, heritage lord i pray for courage i pray for bravery i pray that this resource would be an encouragement to them of what their next step could be whether that is to have a phone conversation with the head teacher or department lead or to speak to their child directly in what they're learning uh, and express an entrance. Lord, would you be with all of us, I pray, as we continue to make Jesus known in this culture and the generations to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, thanks, Alicia. Our thanks again to all of you who've joined us. Please do stay connected. Let us know if we can serve you in any way with time to talk resource. Contact us if we can send it to you. But until then, every blessing for the week ahead. Thanks again for your time. We look forward to joining you again in some other time and sphere. Until then, be blessed. Mm -hmm.